Hello and welcome back and today I want to talk about how to set up your brand new DS1019 Plus in the best possible way. Now I've been talking about NAS on this channel and the other channel and the blog and it's fan and all that stuff for a number of years now but for so many of us we've never used the NAS for the first time and so when you've been recommended to buy the Sonology DS1019 Plus you're wondering What's the best way to set it up? Because I don't want to go through this too many times. It's like an adventure game when you choose the right class at the beginning. You want to make sure you make the right choices straight away. And hence why I've made this step-by-step, video-by-video guide. So this is going to be our first step, choosing the right RAID for you, as well as setting up shared folders. These are two very important things at the early stages of setting up your NAS, because these will help you, moving forward, build up the rest of your data storage setup. So let's get to the screen. Okay, so here we are on the desktop interface of my local PC, where I'm going to show you guys the best way to set up your DS1019+. Plus. I'm going to go through all the steps in the following videos, but today's video, we're going to look at the initial setup. Now, we're going to talk about all the little bits and bobs that are important during setup and really what's not important and you can care about later on. The first tool you're going to need to download is Synology Assistant. It's available now from the Synology's website. It's completely for free and available for PC and Mac. It also is worth mentioning that you can set up a Synology NAS with a desktop um, sorry, a mobile application called DS Finder from iOS and Android. But again, we've got a video on that already. And if you look at my other video about the setup, it's very straightforward. But for now, I just want to focus on using a desktop interface for setting this device up. Once you've installed the Synology application, it will look for the device on your home network. You've got already popped in the drives and you've connected the power and the network cable from the instructions. And within two to three minutes, the unit will appear here. So once you've seen it appear on your network, there's my network there, we double click and it will open up the web browser and from the web browser it will start the installation process. So once the browser's opened up, sorry I've only just booted this PC so it's just waking up, it will find the NAS on the network, there's its address and we'll talk a little bit about IPs later on. Uh, and once it's found that on the network it will ask you to start setting the device up. Click setup obviously. Now from here you can either install uh, the DSM manually or automatically. If you do automatically and just click install now, the NAS, once you, if you've got internet access on that network, it will find the DSM, that's the user interface, the operating system for this NAS, and install it uh, automatically. Alternatively, you can go for a manual installation and that lets you go to the Synology website and download the installation file for this NAS. And if you want to go for an older version of the DSM, which I don't recommend, or you want to try a beta such as DSM-7, and the beta of which should be coming out relatively soon, then you can go to that download center, download a specific um, installation, download it, that will be a .pat file, and then you can browse for it on your local download folder, and then install it manually. But for now, we're just gonna go ahead with the automatic installation. Once you click continue, you will notice straight away that it will say to you that all the data on the hard drives inside the device will be wiped. So if you do have data on these drives, they will be completely deleted. If you are porting drives over from a previous Synology NAS, you will be given the option here to migrate data over. But because these hard drives don't have any data from a formal Synology NAS, such as an old one I'm bringing over, this message has not appeared. So for now, yes, I'm more than happy to wipe these drives. <clears throat> and now the installation will take place. They're gonna be completely formatting these drives. And if you are using older drives that had a partition on them, this partition will be completely eradicated. The drives I'm using inside this device are WD drives, and we're also doing a mixture of different drives to show you something later on to do with SHR. But for now, these drives are now going to be formatted they will install the disk station manager on this NAS and then the device will be rebooted. This can take anywhere from between 5 to 15 minutes depending on the hard drives. Uh, they're saying approximately 10 and what I'm going to do is fast forward and see you guys once this has completely installed the DSM and rebooted the system. Once the device is rebooted you'll be presented with this screen where you have to create a name for your NAS as well as create a user account. Now in the next video, we will talk about multiple user accounts and groups and all that sort of stuff and teams. But for now, what you're creating is the administrative account. This is the main account for all of the control of the device. Don't worry, if you forget the password, you can retrieve it. But for now, let's call this 
uh, device what exactly it is. We're going to call it the DS1019 Plus. And then on top of that, we're just going to go for a nice, simple, basic admin password password. And I do recommend that you go for your own login pup details because those are comical. Once you click next, these details will be assigned onto the NAS. And from here, we can continue some of the initial setup of your device. Now, DSM, once again, the software this NAS is based around, all the apps, all of the Synology functionality, and the platform with which you will be utilizing this device in a user interface and backend manner is already installed on this device. What you're looking at here is how do you want the device to behave going forward? So with regards to updates, do you want them to be automatic? So the latest versions are always put on there without your consent. Only have the key ones, such as big version changes from 6.1 to 6.2 to 7, etc., or just to let you know when they're available. For now, I'm gonna say automatic because that means all your, ad, um, your applications will run to their best standard with all the fixes and all those security updates because the hackers aren't taking a day off, so nor should Synology. And you can set a time and date for it to check. On top of that, you can run smart tests on the hard drives, and these are just tests to see the health of the drives. And DSM-7 will have some new updates with regards to background checks and notifications on those drives. But for now, we are gonna let those smart tests periodically happen alongside warnings for bad sectors on drives. That's kind of one of the big telltale signs for if there's a problem with one of your drives. Clicking next, we can move forward onto the next section. And from here, we can set up the Quick Connect. Now with Quick Connect, this is your ability to connect your NAS um, uh, to an access the, from the internet. Because right now, you have full access to this NAS over your local network. A network in caveman speak is all the devices that share the same internet connection in the home or an office. And again, they're incredibly caveman and not truly accurate, but ultimately, your TV, your console, your smartphone, if they're all using the same internet, the same location, they are on the same network. And again, that is a caveman comparison. A network is a lot more than that. But if you want to access your NAS via the internet and not that network, that internal connection of all your devices, you need to set up a Quick Connect account. It doesn't cost anything. And this lets you access the NAS externally. But for now, we're gonna skip that because that's something more personal to you all. And we're just talking about setting up this NAS. So for now, we're gonna skip this step. After that, you could have set up an option with regards to IPs, which I will touch on before the end of this video. But if we move forward, you can ask whether you want to share your information of, uh, with Synology about all the things that you do so they can improve their service. But for now, we're just gonna click go and go straight into DSM on our DS1019 Plus. Now, you, again, with regards to analytics, you can go with that, but for now, I'm just gonna say, remind me later. And this is just telling us some of the bits and bobs about DSM. Now, I've done whole videos on the subject of DSM already, so I'd recommend you check them out. So I won't go into too much detail about the user interface itself, but this is just the help guide to give you pointers. Down here is a very low spec version of your resources. Up here is more information about notifications and more. And on the left here is your desktop interface. If you've ever used a PC, an Android or a Mac system, you know how desktop interfaces work. Now from the package center, you can install newer and better apps for your Synology NAS. Make sure you agree to the terms and conditions, sign your life away, etc. And this is where you install apps. And I will go into more detail with regard to the installation of those apps in a future video. So we'll go there and these are all the apps you can install and we'll come out of there. But next, I want to talk to you about RAID storage and shared folders, the last part of this video. Now, oh, it's just still giving us notifications about the desktop there. The next thing you need to do is head over to the storage manager. Now, RAID is important. It's probably one of the main key features that a number of people have purchased a NAS for. It gives you the ability to have multiple hard drives and create a huge amount of storage that's both network and internet accessible but thanks to RAID or redundant array of independent disks, you can set it up that if you have data spread across multiple disks, and you can have a safety net if one of them breaks. A hard drive is one of the most fragile parts on a NAS next to the PSU, the power supplier, and therefore having a safety net is important. There are different RAID configurations, and we'll go through some of them now. But the first thing we need to do is create a storage pool. 
Once we create our storage pool, we can choose whether to go for traditional RAID configurations, such as RAID 1, RAID 5, RAID 6, and RAID 0, don't go for RAID 0, um, or a more flexible RAID configuration, such as Synology's hybrid RAID system. Now, before we proceed, let's do a very brief overlap uh, overview of RAID. And again, I have a whole video about RAID. Do check it out in my video listings. But the RAID configurations you can do on this device are as follows. You can do a RAID 0, which you shouldn't, uh, which combines all of your drives into one giant array of storage. And what that does is create one enormous volume, one giant bucket of storage where you can save all your data. However, <coughs> Array 0, although it has great read and write speeds, is terrible for redundancy. If you lose one drive, the entire thing falls apart because data is written across all the drives. The next configuration is called a RAID 1. This requires at least two drives and requires two drives to mirror one another. Again, great read and write speeds and because you've got one drive that is a complete copy of the other, you have one drive of safety if one breaks. However, you lose 50% of your overall capacity because you're using one out of two drives. The next is RAID 5. RAID 5 utilizes at least three hard drives, and in a RAID 5 configuration, let's get these drives up on here, in a RAID 5 configuration, what you can end up doing is spreading data across three drives. And as that, uh, at least, or three or more, and you may notice these are SSDs here, we'll get to that later on. You can spread data across these three drives in waves, and every time there's a wave of data across these drives, a tiny blueprint of the wave is placed on one of the drives, called parity. And with every wave, the parity moves to each drive. And the result is, if you lose one drive due to hardware failure, you can retrieve your data and rebuild it by installing a new drive, and the system will rebuild the data that was on that last drive using the blueprint that was moved from drive to drive, the parity. Now, a RAID 6 is exactly the same thing, but utilizes at least four drives and gives you two drives of parity. So you end up with a, every wave of data, two little blueprints are put on two disks instead of one. And this happens with every wave, and you can do that with at least four drives, and you can add more than that. As safe as that sounds, you do, of course, lose at least one drive in a RAID 5 and two drives in a RAID 6 worth of capacity. Also, the read and write speeds are a little lower than any other RAID because the CPU has to work a little harder to build that blueprint. There are other configurations such as RAID 10, RAID 50 and RAID 60, but we're not really going to touch on those here. But one thing I do want to talk about is something called SHR. It's called SHR Synology Hybrid RAID. And that is a flexible RAID system that is the same as almost all of those RAID configs. It gives you at least one drive of fallback position, be it um, whether you've got two, three, four, five or 20 drives, as well as giving you the ability to mix and match drives. Now we've got mixed drives here, and I'm not gonna mix these up, but the reason you have mix and match drives is because you may have bought this NAS now with a big pile of storage, and that's great. But what if in three, four, five, six years from now, all those drives are full? And you don't wanna start deleting anything. So what you can do in an SHR is replace one drive with a bigger drive. And then after that, replace another drive with a bigger drive and give you the ability to mix your drives and increase the storage over time. Traditional RAID does not give you the ability to mix and match drives and only lets you use the same drive in every single bay, otherwise the RAID is unstable. SHR is the only RAID config that lets you add and mix and match drives. And what I'm doing right now is I've got three 4TB WD RED hard drives but I've also got some Samsung SSDs here. In a later video, I am gonna introduce bigger and better drives to this device to show you. But for now, these drives here are only gonna be used as cash in a later video. So for now, let's set up an SHR on these drives. We go to storage pool and we click create. We're gonna go for the flexibility, flexibility of the Synology Hybrid RAID and we click next. We say we want an SHR, but of course we can select all the other RAID configurations if we want. But for now, we're gonna go for the SHR and we're just gonna leave it as the name SHR. And next, we click next. Then we say which drives we're going to utilize. Now, we're not gonna use those SSDs. They're gonna be used for cache in a later video. And for now, we're gonna use these three disks in an SHR. After that, we click next. 
It will let us know that all the data on these disks will be deleted, of course, we've already formatted them earlier. And it's just letting us know the fault tolerance, so one disk of failure, that's the fault tolerance, the safety net, and the overall storage we shall have at the end. And again, these are 4 TB drives, and of course, instead of having 3 times 4 TB, we're going to have less than that because of the safety net. And then we click Apply. Now, once we're creating this storage pool, it's worth mentioning that an SHR like a RAID 5 or a RAID 6 can take a considerable length of time and sometimes can take upwards of 6 to 12 hours to complete, depending on the drive you use. So you will notice that initialization will take a greater length of time than you expect. If you've gone for a RAID 1 or a RAID 0 or a RAID 10, they're relatively instantaneous. But in the case of a uh, larger array with three disks or more in an SHR, it can take time. The reason we went for a storage pool, as the message states on screen, there is a difference between storage pools and volumes. A storage pool is the maximum amount of storage you are working from. <clears throat> a volume is when you create independent um, storage areas where you can utilize for different things. So maybe you create one giant storage pool, but then one volume for all your TV and media, one volume for surveillance, and another volume for backups. And all of these volumes live on the storage pool. So for now, we'll click OK, and we can see that the verification and consistency checks are happening right now. Next, we need to create a volume. So we head over to the Volume tab, and the Volume tab will let us create a volume that can live on that storage pool. Next, we need to click Custom, because what we've done is we've already created a storage pool, so we'll go down to here. If we go into Quick, it will ask us to do the other steps. And from there, click Next. We need to select an existing storage pool, such as the one that's currently being initialized, and we click Next. There it is, our storage pool that we've created earlier. And then we click Next again. This is where we can select how much storage we want to lit, how much of the storage on here we want to use. For now, I'm going to create a volume that uses the entire storage pool. But again, you can create multiple storage pools on one device if you so choose. But for ease of use, we can just go ahead and use the full available capacity. Now, here is where you'll choose between BTRFS and EXT4. Externally on your devices, you're not really gonna see all the difference. The difference is internally. EXT4 is widely regarded as the most common operating system, uh, file system, I should say, for using NASes. If you do intend to move these drives to another NAS at a later date, often EXT4 is your best choice. But in terms of overall utility and, you know, and features, BTRFS is a great deal better because a lot of the checks, the background, the integrity checks, and more of your data is done in the background with less of a hampering on your system performance. I'm going to select BTRFS. From there, it just wants to confirm that the settings we're going for are completed, and we click Apply. That will finish, and now we're creating the volume of storage available on our device. This is now going to create this volume, and in the next step, we are going to talk about um, shared folders before we end the video. But while that completes, well, let's just take a moment to talk about IPs very quickly, just something to talk about while this completes. Now, in the long run, um, IPs are probably going to be one of the boringest things you're ever going to deal with. It is just dull, okay? And all you I'm going to bore you with today is the difference between dynamic and uh, static IPs. An IP is the address of your device on the network. Remember earlier on that base caveman comparison we made? Your network being just one of the thing that all your devices share the same internet? That is your network. Well, if we continue that line of logic on that horrendous um, simile, we can talk about IPs. Now, your IP is the address of your device on the network, this number at the end. So every device on that network has a number, and that number is kind of their identity, and it's how every device talks. So it goes, ah, I am number one. I want to talk to number three, my smart TV to stream the media. Today I want to back up from the laptop. That is number four on the network, and that's what IPs are for. Now, by default, your NAS will be on a dynamic IP. That means that your NAS will be 
um, flexible if more or less devices are on your network. But you're going to need to have hundreds of devices to see the benefits of a dynamic IP. You don't have to change these settings. They're absolutely fine as they are. But once you start using the NAS in a um, more regular fashion and have lots of devices communicating from the NAS over the network and the internet, it's very beneficial to create a static IP. And if you create a static IP, what the result is that that IP, well, this address will never change. And that's important because if you're running regular backups from dumb devices or are using the internet connectivity that that MyConnect service provides, a static IP is going to be very important. So if you do that, click here and assign a static IP. Once again, not hugely important, but just so you guys know the difference between a static and a dynamic IP. And again, there's all kind of rules here that you can play with, but we're not going to talk about them today. As we can see, the volume is still being verified right now. The next, next step we're going to go to is make our way into the file manager. I've already written it, but I'll open it again. Once you go into the file manager in the file station application, you will see that there are no shared folders. In fact, it will tell you you have no shared folders. Now, a shared folder is slightly different to a regular folder. Obviously, folders are where your files live, and you can create lots of folders within folders within folders. But if you want these folders to be accessible to, for other devices on the network, be it to stream media, to back up to, or for surveillance purposes, as well as making folders accessible over the internet to users that you want to share with and to access via the mobile application when you're on holiday or something, you need to create a shared folder. This is a folder with internet and network access, not just access within the NAS, but accessible outside the NAS. So say we create a new shared folder called my share. Now we don't have to, we can give it a description. We don't have to, but it's an option. We can say it's location. So once again, the volume we just created, we can say whether we want this hidden or visible. We can say if we want it to have a recycle bin in case we delete stuff accidentally. And you can access um, this as an admin only, or when in the next video we talk about users, I can show you about how you can give some people rights to that folder. So for example, if someone deletes a bunch of data, they can't retrieve it, but the admin can. And again, users with their own permission, you can assign how much they can see. So for now, we click next. We can say whether we want it encrypted. And again, encryption is always a valid thing to consider, particularly if you're backing up to other devices. But for now, we're going to click next. Just bear in mind, encryption will lower your read and write a pinch. From here, we can say when we want the background checks to happen and file healing that arrives with BTRFS. And again, we can click that to make all that happen in the background without knowing. For now, I'm going to disable it just because we want the performance to be nice and straightforward. Also, you can say that this folder has a limit to how big it can get, because otherwise this shared folder could occupy the entirety of your NAS storage if you want. So I'm going to leave that as unlimited for now, but if you wanted to make sure this shared folder only has a limited amount of storage, say for family or team members, that is an option. We click next, and our shared folder is ready to be created. Just click apply. Now the shared folder has been created in the background, it has also popped up and listed our current number of users. Now at the moment we've only created our administrator account and of course there's a guest. You can say whether these users have access to this shared folder. In the next video when we talk about users and groups, I'll tell you about the differences and how to configure these things a lot easier. But for now we click OK and our shared folder is complete. There's our shared volume on the network and there's our shared folder. So anything we do in here, for example, we create a normal folder and just call it my files. We've now got a folder here that we can drag and drop into the screen files or we can upload files directly from our NAS. There's my download folder that's full of all kinds of stuff when it opens. From here, we can individually select a file and upload it to our shared folder. So for now, let's go for a nice basic image from one of my videos. Let's go for anything. Mac Mini versus the Plex Media Server. It will now upload this file. And this is an audio file that is now being uploaded to the NAS. 
it will tell you when it's complete and there it is in the shared folder. Now before I wrap things up in this video, another little tip for you guys out there that want to utilize your shared folder on your local area network on a PC but don't want to have to log into the DSM. If you head back to the Synology Assistant application, right click it and go to Map Drive. From here, put in those login credentials you created earlier. Click Next. It will search the NAS and it will find that shared folder you created earlier. From here, click Next. Assign a letter. So normally C and letters like that are utilized on your NAS, but select any letter. Let's go for Z. Then click Next. Open the map to drive upon completion and then click finish. And as you can see, we've now got that mapped network drive on our PC. So if we go to the PC settings, there is that my share folder. Ignore these three, they're from another video. And you can go to here and there's that file we uploaded. We are now accessing the NAS but using Windows software. And this is how you use the NAS for lots of software that wants to communicate with the NAS but doesn't want to use DSM. So if you're using photo editing software, if you're using word-based applications, backups and more, you can use this to assign these directories on those third-party softwares on your Windows or Mac machine to send and receive files from the NAS without using DSM. But this has been the first part of setting up your new DS1019+. Plus. Hope you've enjoyed this and do stay tuned for the next video where I'm going to talk to you guys about user accounts, group accounts and administrative rights. I know, exciting stuff. See you there.